So just, I'm going to start with some introduction of naturopathic medicine and then we'll get into some ways that naturopathic medicine can help you and can really help anybody. So Bastyr University, our campus is located in Kenmore and you can see by, ooh, looks like we've got things changing on my computer but nothing changing on here. Ken, do you want to give me a hand? So I'll just start talking you don't really need the picture for it so much. Um, but our, our campus is located in Kenmore, um, where we don't just teach naturopathic medicine. It's things like acupuncture, nutrition, um, permaculture, herbal sciences. You can get a doctoral degree, great, um, and um, master's degrees as well. So that's a picture of our campus. It's located on St. Edward State Park. It's a beautiful place to visit if you haven't been there yet. And here we are at the clinic. Um, we do naturopathic medicine visits here, acupuncture, nutrition, counseling, and the list kind of goes on and on. And I think what's great about our clinic is that we have patient-centered care. We'll, we'll really listen to what you want, what do you want to leave the visit with um, the first time that we see you and kind of work together with what your goals are. Um, this is kind of what a typical first visit looks like. Um, where you'll have a couple of students getting information from you and then the supervisor comes in and um, works together with the students and kind of helps to help them take a case and so it's really great because you've got three minds working on your case which is really helpful. I'm going to talk a little bit about some history of naturopathic medicine. So it actually originated with Hippocrates um, bunch of different traditional medicines throughout the world. And it became a distinct profession in Germany in the early 1800s or mid 1800s. So it's been along, around for a long time. And so in 1896, um, Benedict Lust, a medical doctor, he established the first naturopathic college in the United States in New Jersey. In the early 20th century, there were more than 20 naturopathic medical colleges in the United States. Currently, there are six in the United States. But you can see that in the 1940s and in the 1950s, we saw the introduction of antibiotics, um, better surgical procedures, and medical miracles that kind of became the norm instead of treating the body naturally. What does that, what does that mean? Uh, what's an example of medical miracles? Hmm, that's a good question. Anybody have an idea? Yeah? Like prednisone. Yeah, so steroids, those oh. kinds of things, you know, took care of the problem right away. So it kind of seemed like a miracle until, you know, you keep dealing with the same problem over and over again. Thanks for the help with that. Yep? Were doctors, like, practicing pretty much naturopathic medicine prior to the 1940s, like most doctors? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see that there are a lot of naturopathic colleges in the early um, 1900s. And, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago, people were practicing naturopathic medicine. Because so I'll get into a little bit more about nature's laws, and that's kind of what we need to follow to be healthy. All right. And so, just to give you a little background about uh, training of a naturopathic doctor. So we're trained in all of the basic sciences, just like a medical doctor is. You can see the, um, this might be a little hard to read, but you'll kind of get the idea as I walk you through it. So the green bar here are credits from Bastyr University, and the black bars are credits from um, the University of Washington, so medical school there. So you can see that um, they're pretty equal for the most part. Um, the very end over there, the second one to the end. So this one here is clinical and modality training. So you can see that Bastyr University kind of doubles the University of Washington. That's because not only are we trained in the basic medical sciences and all of the ologies like cardiology, endocrinology, but also things like botanical medicine, counseling, nutrition. So a lot of extra things we're trained in in order to treat the person the way that they should be treated. So NDs are trained as primary care doctors, and really that's what our training is in, is primary <coughs> care medicine. We don't really specialize in gynecology or 
obstetrics or anything like that. Some naturopathic doctors might have an affinity for treating certain conditions or they might like to work with certain populations more than others, but really we're experts in primary care conditions. So there's some common misconceptions um, about naturopathic doctors and naturopathic medicine. So what I do, we take insurance. Um, you have to check your insur insurance plan to see if naturopathic medicine is covered by your insurance plan. A lot of people don't know that they can see a naturopathic doctor for all of their annual screening, their blood work, physical exam, and all that. And your insurance will cover it if it's within your plan. I do prescribe medications. There's a time and a place for antibiotics and blood pressure medications. So we do have prescriptive rights in the state of Washington. And we usually spend more than 30 minutes face to face with the patient. You know, you might be at um, a clinic for an hour, but how long do you actually spend talking with the doctor or the person who's providing your care? Well, here we spend, you know, the first visit is about an hour long, where maybe 10 minutes of that time you're in the room by yourself. The rest of the minutes, the 50 minutes, you're talking with the students or you're talking with the students and the supervisor, which some people really enjoy and that's really sometimes not enough time to get all that information because it's important to learn where someone has come from and where someone's going. Um, things that I don't do, so I don't prescribe a supplement instead of a medication. Um, it's more of looking at the whole person and treating the foundations of health which I'll talk a little bit more about um, as we go on. So it's not just switching out a natural product for a pharmaceutical. It gets a little bit more complicated than that. So there's a lot more philosophy behind that. And I don't consider screening as prevention. So let me tell you a little bit more about that. So I want to work with you before you get high blood pressure or cancer. Um, screening is an important way to catch certain medical conditions, but I like to prevent the condition before um, screening comes along to find it. Does that make sense? So what about if they, uh, if they got it? Mm -hmm. Would that be like starting as a whole person again, or, or would that be too specialized? I mean, what if they got all the cancer? Mm -hmm. So in, naturopathic doctors aren't allowed to treat um, cancer or right. oncology, but there are adjunctive treatments that we can do for symptoms of that illness or disease in in terms of cancer treatments. Right. Mm -hmm. Like a symptom would be what? So if you're on chemotherapy and you have nausea um, or weight loss, there are things we can do to kind of help counteract those side effects. Mm -hmm. Well, with a patient pops not to go like the allopathic route and they don't want to do chemo. For cancer treatment? Uh, yeah. Uh, will you treat them? Yeah, maybe? that becomes a little tricky and I think that would be a conversation to have with the person. Um, but there's kind of ways around that. But it's usually um, important that the person has an allopathic doctor that they're working with in, when, if they have cancer and then you can have an allopathic doctor as well. And some people choose to have a naturopathic doctor as their primary care physician. Other people choose to have a naturopathic doctor just as, um, as a helper for other conditions and that kind of thing. So we've got some pretty colored triangles here. I'm going to talk a little bit about the principles of naturopathic medicine, um, which are very similar to the principles that medical doctors use but I think the way that we're trained in terms of philosophy behind these principles is a little bit different. So I believe in the healing power of nature. So that could mean um, certain herbs as healers, but it also means that um, nature has certain laws that we need to live by in order to be healthy. So that's things like getting enough sleep, eating a well-balanced diet, drinking enough water, getting sunshine. If you don't do those things, um, then people usually see symptoms and issues along the way. Uh, first, do no harm. So that's another principle. So naturopathic medicine or naturopathic doctors will start with the treatment that will do, will have the least amount of impact on the person while still being able to treat the condition effectively. 
And I'll show you a pyramid diagram that will better explain that as we go. Um, I work to treat the whole person. So looking at your physical, mental, and emotional well-being, taking all those things into account, because all those things determine your health. And doctor as teacher, or docere in Latin, um, so that is really explaining to you how your body works and why I'm choosing to go for a, one treatment over another. So it's back to that patient-centered care. Are you really involved in your treatment and um, your health along the way? So here's that prevention is the best medicine, so kind of coming back to that. So kind of preventing the condition or the disease or the symptom before it comes. And that um, kind of ties back to the healing power of nature, so kind of following nature's rules. So identifying and treating the cause. So it's a lot of investigative work. Um, naturopathic doctors are allowed to order labs and that kind of thing to get a little bit more information about um, why you're dealing with what you're dealing with. So if this window was shut in this picture here and the room was completely black, how would you um, light up this room again? Anyone have any ideas? And we'll open the window again. So we got open the window. Candle, candle I heard. iPad. <laughs> iPad, of course, yeah. <laughs> iPad, iPhone, computers, all those will bring light. Okay, so you can see the common theme here that we're adding light. We're not taking away the darkness. So that's kind of what I see myself doing is, I don't take away someone's disease or someone's symptom, I'm adding health to the person. And adding health will bring balance to the body. So you see this little pie shape here, we've got different slices of the pie. So there's things like your job, your health and fitness, spirituality, spirituality environment and earth, love and emotions, family and friends, so all of these things are assessed by a naturopathic doctor. This is treating the whole person. And all of these should be um, fulfilled within that person in order to achieve health. So all these things are important to your health. If you're working at a job that's bringing you a lot of stress, you're going to see um, issues down the line with that. So I've got another little game for you guys. So here's a picture. Um, what does everyone see here? You can just shout out some answers. <coughs> so forest, trees. Green. A lot of green. Branches. Branches. So actually, if you look right there, do you guys see that little picture? It might be hard for those of you in the back. Is that now? Yeah, it's a little gnome. Yeah. yeah, in the tree. So this is just a little representation of the forest of the healthcare industry. And it's really hard for anyone to stick out in the healthcare field today. Because um, there's lots going on, people are really busy, visits are really short. Um, but the great thing about naturopathic medicine is that we let you stick out and um, you stand out and we look at you and treat you as a whole person. So this little description here is at the bottom we see things like disease and signs and symptoms and then up at the top of this ladder here we see restoration of function and health and well-being. So a lot of people come to the doctor at the very bottom here where they have a disease or they've got some signs and symptoms that, that they want treated. Um, so what I do is I work to get you off of this step here and to kind of move towards the top. And kind of coming back to again where I don't remove disease, I add things that can lead to health. So is it, mm -hmm. it, it, it sounds like you are, you're using the skirting word cur, uh, cure, but you might cure by, by dealing with the whole person, you might Remove the disease. Yeah, it's quite possible if 
You break but, you, but is it like a legal thing? You just can't say that you cure it, but so you say, mm -hmm. you know, okay, because it, it it seemed like there that was possibly. Yeah, well, I guess cure is always possible, right? right. You always hear some stories of someone has cancer and then they go in for their follow-up and they haven't done any treatment or anything and it goes away. Right, right. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that we cure anything, but I'm saying that we kind of really bring somebody into balance by adding health uh -huh. and, and bringing the body into an, its normal physiologic processes will, will not allow pathology or disease to be there. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what the aim is. Okay. So we've got, um, this is kind of what I was just talking about. So normal physiology is health, right? And abnormal physiology is disease or dis-ease. So now this is kind of the fun part, if you guys aren't having fun already. This is, I think, <laughs> the most fun part of the talk here is where you get to learn some things that you'll actually be able to take home with you and start trying to normalize your physiology. And I'll explain things um, a little bit more. Um, let me know if I'm explaining too much or you need some more information about how something works. So talking about, um, you've got five elimination organs. So your skin, your lungs, and your GI or your um, intestines. And so you can see that on this graph here, we've got surface area. So um, your skin um, compared to your um, intestines, like if you were to stretch them out and open them up, they have a lot, like 200 times more surface area than your skin does, which is huge. So that's why it's so important to treat your gut and your stomach and all those issues because it's got a lot of surface area, a lot of interaction with other cells and things going on. Same with your lungs. Your lungs have a huge amount of surface area too. And then we get over to the kidneys. Um, so that's just looking at how much volume a day the kidneys deal with. Um, so a lot. They process all of your fluids and filter your blood and that kind of thing. So we talked about skin, lungs, your GI, your intestines, um, and your kidneys. And then the fifth elimination organ um, is your emotional system. So that can be things like anger, if someone's building up a lot of anger. Um, you know, you'll see issues like high blood pressure, things like that. So we're going to talk about how to maximize all of these organs. Um, because you take things in on a daily basis, and you want to make sure that you have that same balance of um, getting things out. So you rid things through your skin by sweating. Um, and your lungs, you rid things by breathing, right? Um, your intestines by eating the right foods and, and eliminating and your kidneys by drinking water and um, going to the bathroom. Emotional release, that's something that I think that um, you hear a lot of times in the United States that people don't really express their emotions or have issues dealing with that. So sometimes a lot of the time I spend um, helping patients deal with their emotions in a healthy way. So if you think of your body as a bucket and as the water fills up, um, it could be things like foods that you eat um, or things that are kind of damaging to your body like perhaps smoking or those unhealthy emotions we talked about. It could be any kind of physical, mental, emotional thing that kind of builds that the water up in the bucket. And when you see the water overflowing with too many um, attacks to the body, that's where we see symptoms and dis-ease. So you see the word emunctory on my slide. Um, and that's just a fancy way for saying um, ways out of the body. So like we talked about, the lungs, the kidney, your digestive system, your skin and emotions are ways to get things out of the body. Um, you also have some secondary <coughs> emunctories or secondary ways of getting things out of the body and that's through your mucous membranes, like in your mouth, um, emotions we come back to in your musculoskeletal system. Does that analogy make sense? Okay. And what's the musculoskeletal? So those are all your muscles and your bones. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So you'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that, how your muscles can help facilitate movements of things. So not only is your, are your muscles moving your body, but they're moving things internally, which I'll get to. 
Um, these are the foundations of health, and this is how we're taught in school um, ways to treat people. So usually, starting at the very bottom, these are the basics. I'm going to talk more about the basics kind of one by one as we go through. And it's important to have a strong foundation of your health, because anything else that you add on top um, won't hold, of course, if you think of a house, if it doesn't have a strong foundation, all the walls will fall in, the floors will cave. So think of this as the foundation of your house or of your body. And then we can add on things um, like hydrotherapy treatments to stimulate um, the, the body's ability to heal itself, herbal medicine, homeopathy, all of those things kind of come up the ladder here. Um, and as we get to the top, um, things like correct structural integrity, we're taught in school how to do osseous manipulation, um, adjustments, that kind of thing. Addressing pathology would be giving a certain medication that would address that pathology. And then at the top we see surgery is kind of the very last thing. And this is, this goes back to the, um, the first do no harm. We're starting with very basic things that are easy for the body to deal with and then kind of work your way up the pyramid there. So starting with some basics. So these are the basics. These are how to strengthen your foundation of health. A lot of the times a first visit with a patient, this is what I'll focus on for treatment. Because remember, if these things aren't in place, it doesn't make sense to spend $20 on a supplement when you don't have your foundation set very well. So deep breathing, or breathing. So breathing releases tension, releases toxins. Um, you're releasing carbon dioxide as you breathe out. Um, it promotes relaxation, can relieve pain elevates the mood, aids digestion. So if you just listen to all those things that I rattled off, simply by breathing, you can help to address those types of things. So you can, there are many different ways to breathe. Has anyone here been taught how to breathe? You've been taught, yeah. So we um, actually at Bastyr have a shift called biofeedback, where a lot of the times we'll work with people and teach them how to breathe because um, you're not really taught how to breathe, you just kind of innately do it. But as um, we get older and have a lot more stress to deal with, that can be one thing that is compromised is our breath. So your breath should come from your belly, not from your chest. If you, you can see how you're breathing by placing one hand um, up on your chest here and one hand on your belly, taking your breath in, and you should feel this bottom hand rise. Not this one, because this is a shallow breath like that. Um, you can do things like alternate nostril breathing, yoga type of breathing. I mean, there's lots of different types of breathing you can do. A very simple example would be to inhale for one count and hold that for four, and then exhale for two. So let's all just try that. So let's inhale for one count and hold it for four, and then exhale for two. And you can just feel the mood change in the room when you do that. You know, just kind of a sense of calmness that it brings. So aiming for about 100 of these calming breaths per day can make a big difference in, in your life. And it's amazing how simple these things are, but what a big difference that they can make. So here's a, I thought this was a great picture that I pulled from the internet um, about how to stress less. And you can see that this is the typical person, you know, um, juggling a cell phone, um, kids, jobs, work, lots of things. Um, so there's many different ways to relieve stress. We just practiced one before, and that was having a breathing um, regimen that you do, kind of teaching yourself how to breathe better. Um, but other ways to decrease stress would be to exercise, get out in nature, um, simple things like that, reading a good book. Um, if Someone's having a really tough time decreasing stress. There's um, <coughs> herbal medicines that can kind of help with that, can help your body deal with stress. But remember, that's up higher on the, the pyramid of treatments. Um, water is essential for, for your health. Um, up to 70% of your body is water. And um, you need water for your kidneys to filter your blood and filter things out. Um, you need water to help your blood circulate. 
So your blood circulates things like nutrients, um, so vitamins and minerals and neurotransmitters. So those are the things that can help you sleep at night, um, help your, all of your organs kind of work together. So many important reasons to have um, water. Water can help clear your skin, can give you some more energy. So the recommendation is about one half of your body weight in ounces of water per day. So let's say if you weighed 150 pounds, you should be drinking about 75 ounces of water per day. Movement, this is um, really essential. So it can improve mood, um, can lead to weight loss, of course, can lower blood pressure, um, increase your good cholesterol, and can also help improve sleep. So another whole list of things. Um, so I like to say, you know, some type of movement 30 minutes a day, whether that's kind of walking leisurely outside, or maybe you like to do a little bit more vigorous exercise, but moving is going to kind of help bring your body to a normal physiology. So hydrotherapy, there's a lot of great treatments and benefits that comes from just water itself. Um, it helps to, well what I really like to recommend is um, for people to end their showers on a cold blast. Um, and if you, anyone do that here? I see some hats nodding, yeah. So the more you do it, the more you see that you like to do it and that you really, it really gets your day off to a good start if you do it in the morning. Um, so what that actually does is that, so if you're taking your hot shower, your vessels um, will dilate and you've got blood vessels and then they taper off to smaller little capillaries and your capillaries have these holes in them. Um, so where they exchange toxins and nutrients to organs and to other areas of your body. And so if you just, if you end your shower on that hot, those fenestrations or those little holes in your capillaries, they just kind of, you know, slowly close as your body gets cooler. If you do that cold blast, it'll close them really quick and help that exchange of nutrients and toxins to happen and kind of be done with. So it kind of helps to help to uh, maximize your detoxification processes in a way. Um, it's also been thought to improve immunity. So you know, that exchange of nutrients and toxins while your immune cells are being ex exchanged. So that cold water is going to help them be exchanged in a more efficient way, if you think of it like that. And so once you get really good at doing, ending your shower on a cold blast, like you can start and just, you know, run in the cold and run out real quick. Um, but then once you get really good at that and you enjoy that, you can do contrast showers. So about hot or warm water for three minutes and then 30 seconds cold warm for three minutes, 30 seconds cold. So then you're creating a pumping action of those blood vessels. So the warm water will dilate them and the cold water um, will constrict them and then the warm and the cold. So you've got a good pumping action. You're really pumping and circulating blood and nutrients and everything throughout your body. It's one of my favorite things to recommend for people. If you have issues sleeping and you're waking up in the middle of the night, that can be due to um, an imbalance in your cortisol level, your fight or flight level. And the contrast shower kind of helps to, um, if you do that in the morning, it'll help to kind of um, give you that shock and help to balance your cortisol levels. So that hopefully they're not waking up in the middle of the night. So your lymphatics, have you guys ever heard of your lymphatic system? So I see a few nods. I know everyone's pretty familiar with blood and your circulatory system, but I think people, a lot of people don't know about the lymphatic system. So you actually have twice as much lymph fluid in your body than you do blood. And what your lymph system do is it, it works to um, drain debris from the circulatory system. And so not only do we want to keep our blood vessels pumping really well, but we want to keep our lymph moving well too since they help to clean um, what the body doesn't need anymore. And so ways to maximize flow of your lymph system um, are to do things like castor oil packs, which I'll talk about in a little bit more, um, and also talk a little bit more about dry skin brushing. But the deep breathing that we talked about, so you know, moving your lungs, um, helps to move your lymph system. Your lymph system is an open system, whereas your circulatory system is closed, so it has some pressure in it. Since your lymph system is open and does not have any pressure, it is very slow moving. So you want to do things that maximize its movement. 
when you're breathing, you're moving your lungs, you're kind of pressing on um, your lymph system. Your lymph system is located all over your body, just like your circulatory system. Things like lymphatic massage can help to move it. Regular movement, so moving your muscles is going to squeeze on, press on the lymph system as well. So here's um, what I was talking about before, castor oil packs. Anyone familiar with castor oil? Okay, you can buy in the drugstore, really easy to get your hands on. Um, if you take it internally, it um, kind of works. It, it's, you don't want to take it internally because it'll give you an upset stomach. More like a laxative type of use is what it was used for internally. So external use, um, it works as an anti-inflammatory. Um, it can increase your flow of your lymphatic system. And by increasing the flow of your lymphatic system, since they kind of move all of your immune cells, will help to increase your immunity as well. Um, so what I recommend to people, um, usually on the first visit, so it's like you guys are all getting a first visit here, which is kind of cool, um, mm -hmm. is you get a sheet of um, flannel, cotton flannel, um, and you just kind of drizzle some castor oil on there. Um, so that it's damp, not dripping with the castor oil or else it gets kind of messy. It's a little bit of a sticky substance. Um, and then I have people place it just over their abdomen, um, since that's where your, most of your lymph is concentrated. And then you can add on a heating pad or a hot water bottle. And I usually have people do that while they're laying in bed, maybe reading, settling down for the night. Very calming and relaxing. Um, helps your digestion as well. And then trying that for 20 or 30 minutes a day and um, seeing how it affects you. Um, if you don't, if it seems like it's too hard to put together the castor oil pack is what it's called, you can just put some castor oil on your belly before you go to bed. Just make sure you wear a shirt that you don't mind if it gets a little oily. And then dry skin brushing. Has anyone done this before? So I nice see some hands again. Um, this is pretty cool. It's probably my second favorite thing um, besides the contrast showers. So what you do is you get a natural skin brush, and I usually recommend it before bed, but you could do it before you hop in the shower in the morning, whatever works with you. Um, and what you do is we're stimulating lymph flow, so we're gonna start at the bottom. So you usually start with you know your left or your right leg, and you're gonna brush up, always brush up towards your heart, because that's the area where your lymph kind of dumps out and um, moves on. So you'll do your legs, you know, your belly, your arms, your back, and not your face, um, the bristle. The bristles are a little too harsh for your face, so you can skip your face. And then when you get here, since we want to brush towards the heart, you're brushing down like this, and then up like this. So that helps to move your lymph because it's kind of located right underneath your skin, kind of between your skin and your muscle there. So what's the difference between doing it dry versus doing it with that? So if you do it dry, you're kind of help, helping to um, exfoliate your, your skin cells a little bit more. Probably happens still wet, um, but the dry, when you do it dry, you're kind of helping to move your natural skin oils around, so it can just moisturize your skin a little bit more by redistributing those oils. Okay. Mm -hmm. You have several different kinds of brushes there, so mm -hmm. is there, um, is, it, does it, is that showing us that we can use a different kinds of brushes for this? Yeah, you, as long as it's a natural bristle brush, that's mm -hmm. fine. I've got one that's got a long handle so I can reach on my back. Mm -hmm. um, I think that one works the best. Mm -hmm. and you can usually find them at any type of drugstore or place like that. What about if you have real sensitive skin? You can just start by, so the question was if you've got sensitive skin, what do you do? So you can just start by brushing really lightly. Um, you can kind of shop around. There are some bristles that might be a little bit more um, tougher than others. You could find one that's a little bit softer. Um, I'll give a plug for our dispensary. I think they are $7 in our dispensary, and they're a little bit more of the softer bristles. Uh -huh. Does the salt scrub has the same effect? Yeah, so any type of massage or scrub or anything that you're doing to your body is going to um, press on that lymph system and help it flow a little bit more. And it'll, the salt scrub will also do the exfoliating as well. Mm -hmm. But then it's important to remember to go towards your heart. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then we get to sleep. So the recommendation is about eight hours of seven to eight hours of sleep per night. You know, the more sleep, the better. Some people vary on how much sleep they get, but sleep is really important because it helps to improve your learning and memory. Um, sleep deprivation can cause things like weight gain because it alters the way that your hormones um, interact with each other on your appetite and also the way that you process carbohydrates. Um, it also improves mood and has shown to help certain cardiovascular disorders to prevent cardiovascular disorders as well. Um, sleep deprivation can also alter your immunity by decreasing the amount of natural killer cells in your body which are um, some cells that your immune system um, uses. Um, and, and those cells are really important um, with cancer. So it has been shown that people who get um, less sleep have more of a risk of developing some kind of cancer. So really important to get good sleep. And um, between that seventh and eighth hour of sleep, that's when we get most of our um, rapid eye movement sleep. So that's the important type of sleep where your body is really repairing itself and setting itself up um, for the next day. And sunshine, that's another one of nature's laws is that we need to get sunshine. Sunshine provides us with um, vitamin D and increases vitamin D and boosts serotonin, um, which is a, the feel good mood that we have. Um, sunshine, getting sunshine can prevent things like MS, high blood pressure, um, seasonal affective disorder, and things like that. Mm -hmm. How do you address the lack of sunshine through the winter here in Seattle? Right, so we're kind of at an unfortunate latitude. So it, it depends on where you are in the world and what latitude you're at because of the angle of the sun. So, you know, if you're at the equator, you know, the angle of the sun, it makes that kind of 90 degree angle. Um, here in Seattle, the angle's here, so the rays kind of bounce off and don't really let us absorb them very well. And I think I'm getting too carried away and I forgot what your question was. How do you address it? Like it, was, it seemed like it was something like if mm -hmm. you're supposed to get a minimum of three minutes. I've only been here, I'm just visiting, I've uh -huh. been here for a week. Uh -huh. um, but if you're supposed to get a minimum of 30, 30 minutes a day, yeah. Generally, I heard that there's that you go months. The sun does seasons. come out here. I think it comes out here every day. You just have to be on the lookout for it. Um, <laughs> and then you can go out there and kind of roll up your sleeves and expose your skin a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and even, I mean, this doesn't have to be sunshine. You can even say sunshine slash nature. You know, getting outside and going for a walk and being going to your neighborhood park and being outside. Um, you might get some rays through the clouds a little bit. Um, you know, you can test for your vitamin D levels, you can supplement vitamin D and that kind of thing. But I think what the real importance here is that you're getting outside. All right, well that's the end of what I have to talk to you about. So I'm happy to take questions. We've got 